Well, thank you, Roger, for that very kind introduction. It is indeed a pleasure to be here in Barcelona once again. Uh, it's nice to see old faces. I don't see Eugenio's face. It's hidden behind a beard right now. I didn't even recognize him when I came in. Well, I am going to say almost nothing about isogeometric analysis, actually. It plays a role in uh, what I'll be talking about, but a very, very small role, although perhaps essential, at least in, in uh, one area. So I'll be, I'll be talking a little bit about brittle and ductile fracture. Many of the things I'll be uh, talking about uh, are in way of review. They're sort of well known right now, at least to the community that's working in this area. Uh, but before I begin, let me mention that uh, my collaborators are Chad Landis, my colleague at uh, UT, Isaac Lee, who's a student, Mike Borden, former student and postdoc, who's now a professor at NC State, and his student, Eric Dominell, and Clement Verhusel at Eindhoven. Uh, and, and again, before I begin, I would like to announce that we are going to have a special, special issue of uh, CMAME uh, devoted to phase field applications in fracture. And uh, it is available for submission, so if you're working in this area, uh, please consider this. Uh, the deadline for submissions is October 1st, but that's actually a very elastic deadline. The firm deadline is the review process has to be completed by April 1st so that we can publish the hard copy edition in July of next year. Uh, the papers that are accepted will be published online as soon as they're accepted. And if somehow the process drags out and it doesn't uh, make it into the special issue, it will just revert to the next available issue as a regular submission. And if you go to the website, you'll find a place where you have to identify that you want the paper directed to the uh, phase field uh, special issue. And we have a large uh, a special editor team, as you can see uh, on the bottom there. So if, if you're interested, please consider that. So this is an outline. I'll briefly describe the phase field concept. I think most of the people in uh, the fracture world are aware of it, but perhaps in the larger community of computational inelasticity, perhaps not. I'll, I'll say a little bit about the attributes of it, which I think are really the things that are driving the interest in this area. I'll begin with brittle fracture, talk about the second order theory, which is used most broadly, a theory that we introduced, a fourth order theory of the phase field that, that we think has some advantages and is particularly amenable if you're using the smooth basis functions of isogeometric analysis. Um, I think a lot of interest these days is focusing on the so-called stress degradation function. And uh, the quadratic function has sort of uh, uh, emerged from very early work, even in image processing. But I think there are advantages to uh, think about that more broadly. And in particular, our spin involves a uh, cubic function that I'll describe. Uh, in the area of ductal fracture, uh, the game that needs to be played is how does degradation influence plasticity? And I will indicate our latest attempt at that, and that is to degrade the yield surface with a degradation function. So a phase field model is one that essentially allows you to do fracture mechanics problems purely with partial differential equations. No bells, no whistles, no descriptions. You generate partial differential equations and you solve them, and that describes the fracture process completely. Now the phase field is essentially the marker of the damaged material and the undamaged material. And the way it is typically utilized in this community is that uh, C equals one, a scalar field, uh, indicates no damage. Uh, C equals zero indicates completely failed material. And then there's a transition zone, and then the phase field is over a, let's say, a process zone that has a characteristic dimension L0. So you have this smooth field, ideally smooth field, that is essentially the signature of the entire fracture process. So it started in brittle fracture, and it really began by 
examining the variational formulation of Griffith theory. Now, in Griffith theory, you have the elastic strain energy and you have the fracture energy, which is a surface integral over the unknown uh, fractured volume. In this case, uh, the gamma in red is something you don't know and you have to solve for it. So you can imagine straightforward minimization of this does not lead to any tractable computational scheme. But this has complete similarities with uh, work that had been done in mathematics and in image processing years back, and it is a Mumford-Shaw type functional. And it is well known in that area to develop something that's tractable and usable, you can approximate it in the manner of Ambrosio Tortorelli with a phase field approximation. And there are a little bit more generalizations done here, but this idea was introduced by Frankfurt and Marigo about 17 years ago, and it really opened up this entire area. So the idea is to replace the surface integral with a volume integral in terms of the phase field, and then the phase field essentially, in the sense of fracture, damages the strain energy. And here there's a split uh, between, let us say, the tensile part and the compressive part. We only want to damage the tensile part. I won't go into the details there, but they're quite common now in this area. So this was an important com uh, contribution. Several people now, a number of people, have uh, worked with in these ideas and extended them, including Christian Mia in particular. Now this function is the function of interest, or one of the functions of interest in this theory. This is called the stress degradation function, and typically it is quadratic, c squared. And that really emanates from the early days of the Ambrosio Tortorelli approximation. And in the mathematics literature, this functional, if this was applied to the entire uh, strain energy, has been shown to converge to this. So the signature of the limit as L0 goes to 0 is the surface of the cracked body. Now, wh why is this so attractive? Well, everything now is defined on something you know, the volume. So you have a free energy that includes this volumetric representation of the surface energy. The stress is sort of a damage elastic stress. You have the damage function here. And the variational equations, which are just taken by minimizing that, are the linear momentum equation, if you add in dynamics, and the phase field equation, which is a second order equation, as you can see, is a Laplacian. All the operators are positive, so it's very, very easily solved. There's no challenge really whatsoever in solving this equation. And you can see that the, the phase field is driven to zero by the tensile strain energy and the derivative of the stress degradation function. So the main attributes of really a phase field theory in this context is you can solve a fracture mechanics problem simply by solving those two differential equations. So simplicity and generality are the attributes. And the generality means you can do this in 2D or 3D in exactly the same way. You don't have to worry about nucleation or propagation. It is all embedded in the PDEs. So I think it's really the simplest approach that has ever been developed for general problems of fracture mechanics. So let me just give a quick example of how it works. This is dynamic crack branching. You have an initial crack in a specimen, and you pull it apart, and you pull it apart in the, in the simulation very, very quickly with a lot of energy applied to it. Now the interesting thing in this simplicity is that you solve the entire problem. This is a small deformation problem. You solve the entire problem on the initial domain. There's no crack. The crack is represented in the phase field. So you see this initial crack that just is setting the initial value of the phase field to zero there. The mesh is just a mesh of square elements. They're completely continuous. In fact, they're C1 continuous because they're by cubics. So let's pull it apart and see what happens. So wherever you see red, you're seeing tension, you're seeing cracking, fragmentation, it seems to be blown to pieces, but in fact everything was done on the original geometry. This is just computer graphics in some sense. So if we blow that up and we look at the mesh, 
This is actually the deformed mesh, which is in some sense irrelevant in a small deformation problem, but we've plotted the deformation and amplified it so you can see that actually elements have completely opened up. This is just two elements right through, and that's your, your crack there. And uh, you have patterns like that throughout. And again, just to recall, all calculations were done on this mesh. There's no cracks, really. So it's very, very simple. Now, those are the nice points, but there is a deficiency in our mind uh, for the second order theory. If you just minimize the surface energy, uh, you find that the crack profile has a cusp-like structure, as you can see here. So that's the profile of what would be a, essentially a discrete crack. Now, that cusp means that that function is in H1, but it's not in H2. It's not smooth. And that's going to be the limiting factor in convergence rates for typical discretizations. So we wanted to somehow get around that. And in fracture, you, you think you want to add discontinuities. But actually, within the concept of a phase field theory, what you want to do is you want to smooth that, that solution out. So we developed a fourth order theory that has a biharmonic operator, a Laplacian squared, in the functional. And uh, proceeded in the usual way. Here, when we just minimize the strain energy, uh, the uh, fracture energy, I should say, we have a smoothed out profile, and it's actually C1 continuous. And if you use higher order approaches, this profile should enable you to get higher order error estimates, higher order rates of convergence. Uh, there are two factors in convergence. One is the order of the, let's say, the approximation with your finite elements or your splines. And the other is the regularity of the exact solution. So we're enhancing regularity here, which is kind of contrary to what you might think you want to do in a uh, fracture mechanics problem. And that higher regularity should, in principle, enable higher rates of convergence. And we'll see in a moment, indeed, they do. But to have a simple, a simple impl implementation of that theory, you need smooth basis functions, unless you want to go to mixed methods with finite elements. And then if you do, you're going to find you're going to get a lot of suboptimal rates. Uh, I've done the theoretical analysis of convergence, and really the optimal way to deal, deal with it is to use smooth splines in, uh, in conjunction with this theory. So just a quick 1D example. We just take a bar and just split it. So we fracture it. The convergence of the strain energy, you can see comparing the second to the fourth order theory is much faster with the fourth order theory. And the convergence of the surface energy likewise is much faster. So you see it in this very, very simple one-dimensional setting. If you look at the double cantilever beam, this is again a quasi-static uh, configuration, where we have an initial crack and then we just uh, increase the displacement here to open the crack a little bit more solve it in this mesh. It's a hierarchically refined C1 continuous quadratic B-spline mesh. The L0, the length scale, is 0.5 here. And if we refine systematically, we get a convergence rate with the second order theory of 1 for the surface energy, and we get a, what is asymptoting towards 3, as in the one-dimensional example. So we do get these higher rates of convergence. If we look at a comparison with linear elastic fracture mechanics, just solving a linear elastic problem on a fine mesh uh, for this problem, what you find is uh, the results of the second order theory are, are actually quite good. The fourth order theory are a little bit better, as you can see here. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the strain energy, actually the fourth order theory is considerably better than the second order theory. Nevertheless, there are still some flaws here. If you look at contours for both the second and fourth order theories, what you see for the phase field is sort of a bubble around the crack tip. And you see these shadow zones here and here. And these zones are all indicating sort of partial damage. And that's due to the quadratic stress degradation function, which appears as shown here. If you uh, just solve the homogeneous equations where you let the Laplacian term be zero, so you're assuming sort of a homogeneous constitutive response in essence, the effect of the phase field is to go from a linear elastic material to this very, very nonlinear 
material, where you have a critical strain and a critical stress, and you can see, uh, rather than going linearly up here, you go through this sort of nonlinear phase, and you generate a significant accumulation of elastic strain energy before you reach the critical strain or stress. And then you have a very slow and gradual drop-off thereafter. We think both of those properties are detrimental, and we'd like to improve upon that. So we've gone to a cubic function that has a parameter S in it, and the parameter S is essentially the slope of the uh, degradation function at, at 1. And it's interesting, if you take the limit of S going to 0, that slope going to 0, what you can do is actually create a theory in which you basically have linear elastic behavior up to the critical stress, and then it drops off very, very rapidly, as you can see here in contrast to the second order theory. Now, this is if you freeze L0, then the critical strain will be the same, but you can see the critical stress is enhanced. You can also uh, make the equivalence with the uh, critical stress. But if you do it in this fashion, then in this region of linear elasticity, you essentially have a phase field of one indicating no damage and then very, very fast drop-off compared, again, with the quadratic. So the upshot of that is if you use that in either the second or the fourth order theories, it completely takes out these areas, these problematic areas, as I've shown right here. So if, this is with the same L0. <clears throat> so what is the interpretation of these theories when you have a finite L0? Well, you can really think of them as cohesive zone models. They give you a peak stress and a process zone uh, in this area here that's sort of, let's say, upwind of the crack. This is a very, very fine mesh calculation with linear elasticity. And uh, if you fit these things together uh, in the far field, as they fit very well, as you can see, then you have this uh, peak just a little bit upwind of the crack. And as you, as you uh, take the limit of L0 going to, to 0, although this is not mathematically proven, what the expectation is is that this is converging to this solution here. So each L0, though, in, in essence, is giving you what might be considered a cohesive zone model that is uh, uh, approximating the, the Griffith limit. Now, in fact, you may exactly want that. You may want that critical stress rather than the infinite stress of uh, the neuroelastic fracture mechanics. So in the area of ductal fracture, the, the starting point is a history functional that includes not only the strain energy, but in our formulation, the plastic work. So we have these two terms now. Before, we only had this term. So we're driving the phase field now with plastic work potentially as well. And these are just switches which sort of turn these, uh, these functions on. So that's the, the first enhancement. Now there is an entropy switch. We, we don't allow uh, the cracks to heal, so there's an entropy switch on this, and uh, we don't allow this to reduce. Well, if we look again, though, at the constitutive response, something interesting happens, and I think many people are aware of a problem with this generalization of the theory. It somehow represents not a full ductal fracture model that is consistent with what one sees in experiments. In experiments, you see ductility right up to the point of fracture. And what you see here, the constitutive response, uh, this is, first of all, just the plasticity model, then you have the model with uh, just the elastic strain energy driving things. You get up to the critical stress, and then, bingo, you start to uh, fracture. You start the fracture process. When both of these terms, including the plastic work, is turned on, of course, you enhance this process. It happens earlier. But note, at the point of its incipient fracture, the elastic strain continues to grow, and the plastic strain completely saturates. So there's really no plastic straining going on during this process uh, prior to full fracture. So this is uh, not what you see in experiments. In fact, the damage in typical experiments that I'm aware of occurs only in very, very small zones right before the, uh, the fracture occurs. So somehow you want to fix this 
And uh, the first enhancement that we've done, and there are various ideas floating around, is to uh, degrade the yield surface. So introduce a degradation function that is on the size of the yield surface. Now, another uh, feature that we've added into is a threshold on the plastic work because these things working together, this tends to uh, cause, let's say, fracture very, very early. So we want to uh, hold that back to a point W0. So if you look at the constitutive response again, and for lack of uh, any imagination, just set the uh, yield surface degradation function to the strain energy, elastic strain energy degradation function, what you see is something like these pink or magenta curves right here. Now, the first feature that's sort of not what you'd like to see here, and these are with the quadratic degradation function, I should say, is that the initial yield st stress is reduced. And that is due, essentially, to a property of the quadratic deg uh, degradation function, the accumulation of elastic damage prior to reaching the critical stress. And what that has been translated now to is to the yield surface, and it reduces it. And you get reduced strain hardening compared with the, let's say, the virgin material uh, as you go. And that's, again, that's induced by the contraction of the yield surface. But you still have strain hardening in this case. And then when the plastic work kicks in, at some point you see that you, whoops, you get a very, very quick, uh, well, not a quick a drop off, in fact, a rather prolonged uh, drop off of the stress to full fracture. Now, the good news, though, is that the entire process is plastic beyond a very, very slight increase in the elastic strain due to the strain hardening. There's a slight increase there. So at least that seems to be the right direction. Now, if you equivalence the cubic stress degradation function on the basis of the sigma critical, then what is going to happen is you're pushing in the regime of the, uh, the critical strain much to the left. You're going to have much less strain energy. In fact, in real materials, this is very, very considerable compared with the quadratic. So that requires a different L0, though, now. You need different L0 for the cubic and the quadratic to get the peak stress to be the same. Now, if you do that, the nice thing is there's basically negligible accumulation of elastic damage before you reach the critical stress, and so you actually yield at the correct yield stress. And then you harden for a while, but during this process, again, you're degrading the yield surface, you reach the critical stress, then the drop-off, that very sharp drop-off of the cubic function causes you to get very, very much accelerated, uh, let's say, softening. So the softening now or the uh, contraction of the yield surface overcomes the initial strain hardening and you're actually strain softening. And then as the plastic work kicks in, you get a very, very fast drop-off compared with the other case. So it seems to have the physical properties that are uh, more like what you'd see uh, that are gathered from experimental evidence. And again, in this case, the plastic strain is dominating throughout the, uh, the cycle. So if you look at a tension test, a notched tension specimen, um, these are some preliminary results. It's a fairly fine mesh around here. This is 3D, incidentally. And you get a whole spectrum. I won't go through all of these. But basically, with these parameters, you can control just about everything. Now, the good news and the bad news is in all of these calculations, no matter what we do, we get a crack that is horizontal, which is exactly what we want to see. It begins in the notches, and it propagates horizontally through, even with the quadratic degradation function. So these need to be tuned up for the particular material property, but you have enough features in there to do that. You do get the drop-off, as you can see in the yield for the quadratic here as well, and you don't get that with the cubic. Let me close with one example that I've shown before, but I, I looked at this example and the numerical results for over a year before I recognized one thing, and I'd like to bring that to your attention today. It's kind of interesting. These are experiments that have been done by the Navy with uh, plates, as you can see. They start out as plates, 
They are bolted to a very, very rigid test jig, and there's an explosive charge that is offset by a short distance. And these are some of the postmortems. Various patterns appear. Uh, there are essentially three patterns. You can split in half, you can split in quarters, as you see here, and you can actually split in thirds, and it just depends upon initial imperfections. But you notice here that it's sort of blown open. You have uh, the, in the postmortem, the exploded and finite de deformed plate, fractured plate, has been unbolted from the test jig. But there are a few bolts left behind that turns out to be interesting, and I didn't ever key on that until I examined the numerical results more carefully. So this is the temporal pulse of the uh, explosion, and this is the radial distribution. So it's a dynamics problem. It's all modeled in 3D. It's a multi-patch quadratic NURBS model, and it includes all of the bolts and washes modeled in 3D. Now, the reason for that is we did initially what most people have done that have tried to simulate this. You do simply supported boundary conditions, you do fixed boundary conditions, and then you look at the experimental results and you find you get nothing in either case that looks at all like the experimental results. There have been papers written where the results are completely different and then people will say the correlation is very good, but if you look at the pictures, they don't even look the same. So I guess that's how you publish papers, though. In any event, we became convinced that uh, the details had to be modeled, and we modeled all the bolts. So the, the bolts are bolted, and, the, and it just sits on the reaction frame. So except for the bolts, it could just lift up. So this is a calculation with the second order theory and sort of the basic model without the uh, uh, yield surface reduction. So there's the detailed model of the bolts. Uh, this is the calculation. At the end of the calculation, if you look, you see the bolts. But notice here, looks like the bolts are gone. They're not gone, but you'll see what happened in a moment. And notice those locations correspond to where these bolts still are here. Why is that? Let's look at an animation. What I'm going to do with the animation, I'm going to draw your attention, and I'll drag over the cursor to one of these two uh, bolts. And this crack, we've seeded this with sort of the cross pattern so we get the four leaflets. And the cracks will propagate out to the edge, they'll actually split it, and keep your eye on these bolts. And this is why you have to model the details in a boundary value problem. So here we go, watch this guy. Pretty soon, something happens. Bingo. Those bolts fractured. Those are the only bolts that fractured, the ones around the crack, right there. Now look, those bolts were still there. Why are those bolts still in the post-mortem? Because they fractured too. You didn't have to unbolt them. You had to unbolt all the others. You had to screw them off. But these were just left behind because they had already split in two. So that was a nice feature of the analysis. So with that, I'll conclude. Um, again, phase field descriptions are really nice because they handle nucleation, propagation, branching. Everything is built into the PDEs. Uh, the fourth order theory seems to give you better convergence rates within the context of the phase field problem uh, for both uh, the surface energy and the strain energy and thereby the stress. Um, for the higher order theories, isogeometric analysis is a really nice tool, and you get it often from designs directly, the models, so you can use that. Um, we like the cubic stress degradation function for the uh, reasons I described. It just represents brittle fracture better, and it seems to also represent ductile fracture better as well. The initial results for the ductal fracture are encouraging. We still haven't published anything, even though we've been working on this for a few years. But I think we're getting pretty close to, to doing that. Um, the current things that we're focused on is the degradation functions. We want to introduce uh, stress triaxiality to them, amongst other things. Uh, void representation, things of that nature. and. There's just a lot of tuning that needs to be done. There's already perhaps uh, more parameters than you'd like in a theory, and that needs to be correlated with experiments. I'll just finish with uh, a last calculation. I said it's really easy to do things like this. 
This is 3D. 3D and 2D codes are exactly the same. You don't have to change anything. You just run it with 3D elements. And this is just a sample of a slab with a bunch of nucleation sites that are just weakened to just initiate the cracking in various places. It's with the fourth order theory and C1 continuous these blinds. So there we go. Now you get all sorts of interaction between these uh, fractured surface, impingement, and merging, and it's all automatic. So that is the beauty of these theories. Thank you very much.